now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Tony Incalcaterra, Senior Vice President with Ipsos's Audience Measurement Team. Tony, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, for the sake of being able to uh, see our slides completely, we're going to turn off our webcams so you can focus uh, purely on the slides. It's, it's great uh, to have you all here. Uh, so let's get started. So the data that we're going to cover today uh, is our annual out affluent outlook, uh, which looks at the year ahead. Uh, it has a review of the previous year. Uh, most of the data you're going to see today is coming from our Q1 2023 Ipsos Affluent Barometer. Uh, and, that, and that's part of our affluent intelligence knowledge base. It's, it's really built off uh, our continuously fielded Ipsos Affluent Survey, uh, which believe it or not is, is now in its 47th year of uh, measuring, monitoring behaviors, trends of, of what we call uh, and consider the most important consumer group in the world, which is affluent Americans. Uh, the survey is fielded, uh, this survey in particular was fielded earlier this month, uh, and it was focused on two areas. Uh, the, the first of which, you know, how affluence experienced the previous year, uh, and their hopes and expectations for the coming year. And then secondly, a, a detailed analysis of how they approach their finances, you know, who they trust, what companies they trust, uh, what they plan to do with their investments in the companies in the uh, coming months. So today's webinar, we're going to focus on the overall uh, outlook. Uh, and then you're all going to receive an invitation to a webinar next month that's going to explore in greater detail the financial well-being of affluents uh, and their uh, plans for investments and retirement uh, in the coming year. So over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we're going to cover a lot of material, really as we always do in these webinars. Uh, we're going to organize today's session into uh, four areas. First, we're going to really talk about the framework uh, through which affluents see the world today, uh, how it relates to their personal experiences, uh, how they're feeling, what their hopes are. Uh, and then Jesse's going to take you through some detail on the specific experiences that they, uh, that they had last year, uh, as well as what they're expecting uh, for 2023. Uh, he's going to shift a little bit and cover uh, what we call stressors uh, that affluents are feeling. You know, and these are the things that really have huge implications for whether it's a good year for marketers uh, as they you know, look to maximize revenue from the affluent population. Uh, I'll come back after Jesse's had a chance to uh, discuss how all well this is likely um, to play out and uh, spend some time talking about how it's going to impact the cash register in the in the next couple of months. Uh, so before we before we start, I just want to say that there are three themes that I'm hoping are going to come through today's uh, presentation. Uh, first and foremost is that you know, really, despite the the challenges in the marketplace, uh, affluents have this financial and emotional insulation uh, that you know almost surely allows them to continue to spend. Uh, and frankly, in all likelihood, based on what we're seeing in the non-affluent population, uh, the spending gap, uh, the increased expenditures that affluents make versus non-affluent households is, is going to continue to grow larger. Uh, the general population is likely going to be cutting back on spending in the face of uh, some of the issues that are coming up, whereas we anticipate that affluent households uh, will actually increase spending over what they've done in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the second uh, theme or element that I, I want to bring up is that, you know, we've been through some dark years over the last couple of years. We, you know, we really saw optimism uh, sort of you know, bottom out, uh, you know, during the pandemic, post-pandemic, through, uh, you know, the midterm elections. Uh, there was a lot that was going on, but uh, the good news is that we do see that that optimism is really trying very hard to reemerge. Um, and, you know, as we look at this, you know, thanks to economic factors, 
Uh, but really, mostly, it's the resilience that that affluents have based on you know who they are, what makes them tick. Uh, optimism is going to come back, and we'll we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, but the last thing, uh, the the last element of all of this is that we're really presenting a cautionary tale. So we're presenting information about how we believe this is going to play out as the world moves forward, uh, but we really do need to keep a, a close watch on external factors that, that really could impinge on, on the recovery of optim, uh, excuse me, optimism uh, or you know, slow down spending. So let's, let's first start off by looking at the word hope, uh, which is a big, big motivator. Uh, for affluence. It's, it's quite powerful. Um, and when we couple it with economic power, it can really change markets based on the expenditures that take place as, as affluence open up their pocketbooks. You know, when we look at affluence, in order to, to achieve affluence, you know, people need more than just luck or intelligence. Uh, it, it requires a strength of character. It requires an astute mind. Uh, in order to be able to advance in their careers and earn enough money, uh, not only to support themselves, but to, you know, to essentially create a very large nest egg. Uh, and, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, I think hope is such an important factor in predicting what eventually is going to happen in 2023. So, you know, with this hopeful attitude, uh, affluents are able to, you know, to really maintain, you know, a drive that helps them press through obstacles that might come into play. You know, it's it's the boldness of their spirit, it's their self-confidence uh, that we see in their abilities that, that helps carry them through periods of doubt and uncertainty. We've seen this over the 47 years that we've been measuring this market. You know, in many ways, uh, most affluents are, are essentially unflappable, you know, e even in an unstable world. Uh, now, it's not to say that they're unaware of or you know, that they ignore the problems of the world, but rather they're prepared to zigzag when necessary. So you know, all of that is why you know, we continue to, to preach that, that marketers need to maintain a steady focus on affluence uh, and their continued purchasing power. Because you know, in the end, remember affluent households outspend non-affluent households in a typical year, two and a half to one. Uh, and this year promises to, you know, perhaps see that gap actually get larger in favor of affluence. So let's take a look at the general themes that, that come up as we talk directly to affluence about the coming year. Uh, we see four major themes. Uh, the first is that, you know, there's this belief that inflation is slowing, and we certainly see that in the market, uh, and that prices are going to begin to normalize. Uh, we see, you know, secondly, we see fewer mentions of pandemic-related worries. Not zero, uh, you know, there are certainly some, but they're, they're far fewer than what we've seen in the last couple of years, especially in the verbatims. You know, so my sense is that, you know, COVID concerns are far in the background now. Uh, they could resurface again if, you know, if there's another uh, potent subvariant that develops uh, or uh, if there's something else uh, that that comes about. But I think for the most part, uh, we are we have moved past that. Uh, so, you know, I hesitate to say post-COVID, but, you know, for the most part, it does feel that way. Uh, thirdly, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of sniping between the political parties. Uh, and, and that's certainly very obvious in the words uh, and the open, uh, the open-ended verbatims that we're getting from affluence in these studies. Uh, it, it honestly seems like we're even further apart in ideology um, than we have been. Uh, and there's just a great deal of blaming back and forth uh, about whose fault it is, who's causing the troubles. Um, you know, in the end, uh, affluence are united by a number of things, uh, but we still, uh, you know, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, we still find ourselves in a position where um, politics or political beliefs plays a huge uh, um, part of people's perceptions about the world around them. Uh, and then finally, you know, given the events of the past year in Ukraine, 
you know, and, and you know, unfortunately, the, the saber rattling of, of North Korea and other hotspots, uh, there is worry about global stability and, and the, poten the potential for armed uh, conflict expanding beyond uh, those areas. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. But in their own words, you know, as we talk to affluence, they, they tell us things like they expect to see a recession in, in, you know, in the near term, nearish term. Uh, but you know, generally you feel that this is going to impact others rather than themselves. Uh, so you know, we see things like, yes, I believe a small recession is going to happen, you know, especially in the real estate and the housing market. Uh, they see themselves, however, as recession proof. You know, some of them still intend to reevaluate their spending, uh, potentially shift funds towards savings and investment uh, instead of spending, uh, you know, with, with these things potentially shifting, uh, it's yet another reason for marketers to be focused on affluence to, to ensure you know, really that they're getting their fair share of affluent dollars, whether they are at the cash register or whether they are in terms of their investment portfolio or their savings portfolios. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be critical uh, to watch the money in essence. Uh, now, continuing on the, the theme of hopefulness that I brought up earlier, I mean, affluents are telling us that, the, that you know, they really turned a corner. Um, the worst impacts of the pandemic are, are actually in the rearview mirror. You know, and that, that said, um, there's a clear realization that things are not going back to the way they were, uh, that they're different from before, and that we have to realize uh, in many ways that the new normal you know, the term that we used so much over the course of the last couple of years is really here to stay. So we have to get used to it. Uh, if I were to sum all of this up, uh, it's that affluents are, are really keenly aware of the challenges that are ahead. Uh, they see these things, uh, you know, quite honestly, as impacting others more than themselves. Um, you know, as we say a lot, uh, you know, we, it's, repeat this you know, many, many times, you probably all are tired of hearing me say this, uh, the, you know, the benefit of financial success is that it does provide that insulation from, you know, the woes of the world. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, as a result, um, you know, peace of mind uh, is, sets in for affluence so they can go about living their lives without very much fear. Uh, so let me turn this over to my colleague, Jesse Parrott. Uh, so, He's gonna take you through some of the details about how affluence experienced the past year and what they believe is gonna happen in 2023. So over to you, Jesse. Thanks, Tony. Um, so even though they're personally doing okay or better than okay, once we look beyond their own lives, the affluence are much more worried about uh, the rest of America. Um, last year when we did this, uh, Affluence agreed that 2021 was a good year for the U.S. economy. About a third of them and then about a quarter of them said that it was good for America as a whole. Both of those numbers have dropped in the past year. Uh, one thing that we do find really interesting with this data is that it, women and men tend to have the same responses on the like more micro within their own control measures, their personally career finances company they work for and their family. There's not a lot of difference in how they answer those questions. But on the macro items of the US economy and America as a whole, there's a 13 percentage point difference between the sexes, uh, with women being much less optimistic. Um, and when we look back at a few years of this, there's a trend that women are a little less optimistic, but it was about five or six points, not 13. So this is the widest gap we've seen on that. Um, one thing that we do like to point out with the US economy and the America as a whole, the with the political polarization, these numbers kind of flip depending on who the president is. Um, they always kind of look uh, that far apart. Um, if you want to go on to the next one, to, um, so affluents are optimistic and they find themselves pretty much where they were pre-pandemic. Um, when we look at the, uh, 
at the not every time we run these surveys we get a core sample of uh, non-affluent respondents to look at the differences and what we're seeing is that the financial insulation really protects the affluence in ways that it's not protecting the rest of their non-affluent counterparts so while about a third of the affluent households saw a jump in their net worth in the past year fewer than one in six non-affluent saw an increase in theirs um, we're also seeing the same kind of patterns between men and women here so it's it's just not as um, intense a difference for the non-affluent uh, men and women. They're about 5% difference, what we would see with the uh, in past years among the affluents. On the next one, um, so as I said, affluents are generally optimistic for themselves personally. Um, with the exception of January 2021, where you can forgive people for thinking that the year was giving, ahead was going to be much better than the previous year. Um, we are above where we were at in throughout the pandemic in was last year good and will next year be good for you? Um, it's still not rising to the levels of where we were pre-pandemic and but you know, the last year was very close to what people were saying in 2017 for 2016. So we're seeing improvements. We expect it to continue. Uh, if you go to the next, the career finances numbers look kind of like a muted version of the, for me personally, data. Um, 2022 saw real wage increases across the U.S. Um, Affluents feel good about their careers, but their finances are more tied to the markets than being a than surviving on a paycheck to paycheck um, lifestyle. Um, and now is also when I'm going to remind you that our field dates were January 3rd through 10th. So some of the big tech layoffs, like we saw at Google last week, uh, hadn't happened yet when we saw when we asked these questions, but. Um, others had already happened last year. Um, you go to the next one. So, as I said, most of the affluent optimism is based around the stock market. And what we see here is that the stock market, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, NASDAQ, all drop pretty significantly in 2022. Um, and you see that the affluent optimism for the economy moving forward goes down from 48% down to 33% in uh, November of last year. The stock market, we also had uh, cryptocurrency markets and NFTs. Affluents aren't really into those that much, or the large population of affluents aren't really investing in those right now. So that's not really having the effect, but the stock market is really where you see the effects of the economy on affluent um, optimism. When we get to this year, uh, or this wave, Tony, on the next slide, uh, for most of the past 13 years, our barometer has measured our, aff our economic optimism. You see that for most of the time, affluents are pretty optimistic about the US economy moving forward. They are insulated from real downturns. Uh, during the Great Recession, we saw times where the you know, pessimism overtook the po positivity. Um, and then you know, until COVID hit, we were doing pretty well. And then you see that when the Dow drops down, we get a hit in optimism. Um, right now, the optimism is going back up. We're still a little below water, but it's about, you know, it's 40 to 41 percent. This is really a mass affluent issue, though. Um, the higher one's income is, as you can see, with the 500,000 plus goes up eight points. And then with the people with five million or more net worth, it goes up to 57 percent optimism about the economy moving forward. Those who have money feel like they will continue to be okay. And that's how they see it for the country. Um, 
So let's move on to the things that, what keeps them up at night. For me, it's a six month old, um, but that is not true for the rest of the country. Uh, so we move on. The stock market's what's coloring their view of the economy. Um, the challenges of inflation, uh, federal loan rate increases, put a little damper on their views of the economy moving forward. We I saw this morning that Q4 had a 2.9% uh, uh, growth for the U.S. economy. 34% um, of affluents feel good about the prospects of the economy moving forward. 36% don't. 30% are neutral on it. Um, we're also seeing the party affiliation having the effect on here because the optimism for the U.S. economy is 30 percentage points higher for Democrats than Republicans. Uh, if you move on to the next. When the affluents look at America as a whole, it's up slightly from our mid-year outlook last year, but it's still kind of our low point for um, what we've seen in our January outlook. Um, so, and they didn't really think last year was that great, um, even if it's up slightly from where we were mid-year. Um, again, here you're going to see the Democrats are more optimistic by about 30 percentage points again. Um, so, on the next slide, uh, thanks to their financial success and in insulation, affluents see themselves as being protected. Uh, certainly compared to the rest of the country. They worry about what's happening in the country, but they don't. They realize they're benefiting in ways that many others are not. Um, so that's going to affect how they look at uh, if the country's on the right track or not. In terms of a right track, wrong track data, you can see that the majority of, Af of American affluents think we're on the wrong track right now. Uh, while there isn't much of a difference between the wrong track numbers for men and women, women are much, much less likely to say the country is on the right track. And again, we see that the affluents who perceive themselves to be in the middle class are much less likely to see the country as being on the right track than those who say they're in the upper middle class or the rich or the wealthy. Um, we ask this every wave of uh, running our barometers, and then we ask them why they feel this way. Um, so this month we got you know a lot of answers that were you know focused on inflation and polarization. Um, it's you're kind of you're seeing the political unrest come back. It's not great. Um, my favorite answer that comes up in every wave, this one we pulled from the uh, why the country's on the wrong track, but this shows up in every wave. It shows up on each side of right track or wrong track. We get responses that say Biden or Trump or Obama or whoever is gonna be our next president. Who the president is really affects how people feel the country is going. Um, that's, you know, when we boil it down, that's really going to come down to what people are believing. You go to the next slide. Inflation and the economy generally are the biggest issues facing the U.S. today, um, according to affluence. Um, the big thing that popped out to me here was that abortion is about ranked by first by about 10% of women and 23% by women overall. It's the third ranked issue for women behind inflation in the economy generally with healthcare ranked fourth. And when we want to look at reason that women are so much less optimistic for the country on a macro scale, you can really point to last year's Dobbs decision from the Supreme Court um, to make the point that this is women and not partisanship. Abortion is the seventh ranked issue by Democrats. Um, they have the environment first and the ninth ranked re issue among Republicans who largely said inflation and the economy. Uh, so th it's something to keep in mind. Um, 
the fear of recession has doubled in the past year. Uh, U.S. employment is was at 3.5 percent uh, coming out of December, or 53 or low. Uh, we have rising wages, inflation's decreasing, but inflation is an increased potential threat to people because it's in the news all the time right now. Um, again, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to stave that off, but we'll see what happens. And there's a debt ceiling fight about to happen in Congress, but as you can see, the federal debt and federal deficits haven't really moved in the past year, and it's not a huge uh, concern. Um, with that all happening and tech layoffs, affluents have reasons to worry about this stuff. Um, so. um, and now we're almost a year into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, affluence, you know, global stability is important. A lot of people work in multinational jobs and are worried about that or are worried about many other things as to what that would mean to them. But where we really see the numbers pop up is in economic, is in the prices of things we buy in the US and the gas prices for the very concerned measures. That's where affluents are most worried. They they care about their wallets and that's what's gonna hit them, not you know, they're not as worried about their personal safety because of it or you know travel within the US or even as concerned with international travel. It's it's the things that are going to affect their wallets. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Tony. No, oh, thanks, Jesse. I, I, I always appreciate the added insights that you bring to these uh, to these subjects. So um, thank you. Uh, now that you've uh, we've given you a solid foundation of, of how affluents are feeling, uh, it's time to turn our attention to just how we believe these things will register at the cash register, pun intended. Uh, so let's start with the positive news. Uh, you know, despite those losses that uh, we saw on Wall Street in 2022, about a third of affluents are telling us their net worth increased in the past year. And almost half of them uh, say that their overall net worth was stable uh, from uh, uh, 2021 to 2022. And that, that's really saying quite a bit, you know, considering that uh, some of the previous gains that they, that they had in the stock market uh, and some of the gains that they had uh, on uh, real estate values, housing values, really got reduced over the course of, of 2022. So, you know, for them to be stable or actually ahead of the game really does say a lot. You know, it comes back to the rich get richer. Uh, but really, you know, as, as Jesse mentioned earlier, uh, things like salary increases, job switching, uh, you know, some of the uh, other factors that, that really contributed to a strong financial picture for affluence really helped the case. Uh, you know, on the negative side, um, but, you know, it's a relatively small figure, about one in five affluents said their net worth declined last year. Uh, but most of that was at the lower end of the mass affluent market. So, People who were, um, you know, at the 125 to 150 thousand dollars in household income, uh, people above that, you know, really are, were relatively flush with cash, uh, and and now the question is, you know, are they going to open their wallets and and spend it? So, let's take a look at that. Uh, for the last several quarters, you know, we've been asking people whether this is a good time. Uh, for themselves or for America as a whole to make major purchases now or, or soon. A year ago, uh, we saw roughly two-thirds of affluence uh, saying that it was you know, either a good time then uh, or it was soon enough it would be to make those major purchases. Uh, unfortunately, as, as the year went on, uh, inflation really spiked. It got worse for a few months. Uh, those numbers in terms of uh, whether or not people were ready to make maybe major purchases really steadily declined. So that by the fourth quarter of 2022, only one in four affluents felt that it was the right time to make those purchases. 
uh, you know, a, as inflation uh, tempers uh, and really in, in view of net worth increases, uh, we're pleased to see that those numbers have gone up in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, and it's really signaling that that affluents are, are feeling more comfortable about spending big in, in the coming months. Uh, that is really in sharp contrast to the non-affluent population. Uh, they continue to be pretty reticent about making major purchases. Uh, and now what we're seeing uh, is that gap between affluent and non-affluent households rising again. So if we go back to Q3 of 2021, uh, you know, we saw a huge gap. It was almost twice as many or twice as high a percentage of affluents saying it was the right time uh, compared to non-affluents. That really narrowed. Uh, towards the fourth quarter of 2022, and that's starting to increase again. So affluents are, are ready. Um, we, you know, the smart money, uh, you know, as far as marketers are, are going to be concerned, is pursuing affluent households because th these are the ones uh, that are ready to actually um, put cash on the line at this point. Now, over the next six months, it was, as we talk to affluents and ask them about uh, where they expect to spend money. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, the next six months versus the uh, the last six months. And you know what they're really telling us is that they expect to spend at least the same amount of money uh, that they spent six months ago you know, in the last six months across all of the categories that, that we measured. Now the biggest increases uh, came from food and groceries which, you know, quite honestly, is most likely due to continued high prices for many items. You know, we have all seen news reports about how expensive eggs have gotten, for example, or beef. And, um, you know, you can't simply get away from that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, one of the things we want to point out is that travel, uh, which is, you know, one of those passion points for affluence is, you know, you, we have roughly the same number of people saying they're going to spend more uh, in the coming six months than they did in, in the previous six months. And that really comes back to some of the characteristics of affluent travel. Uh, they, you know, there's this penchant for luxury travel, for, you know, enjoying the pampering services uh, that they wind up getting while they're traveling. Uh, as we look at our, our normal um, affluent survey data, more than three quarters of affluents tell us that they are, that when they're traveling, comfort and service are worth paying extra for. Uh, more than half of them say they go out of their way to make sure that fine food and wine are part of every vacation. Uh, and, you know, as we look at that data, you know, travel is such a passion point um, for affluents that seven in 10 affluents tell us they'd rather spend money on a fantastic trip than on an expensive car. So it's that experiential side of things uh, that's gonna continue to grow. And, and we do expect that we're going to see um, the travel market continue to rebound uh, you know, from the dismal days of uh, the pandemic. Now, given uh, the last couple of years have been odd to say the least, you know, we certainly saw expenditures declining in lots of areas over the course of those uh, those years. Uh, we wanted to get a sense from affluence about how their 2023 spending would compare to their pre-pandemic spending. Uh, again, uh, groceries and travel are the two biggest gainers. Uh, but really, it's important, uh, or we think it's important, to point out that across all of the categories that we measured, these 11 categories, uh, affluence expected their 2023 spending to match or exceed uh, what they spent prior to the pandemic. You know, the areas that are showing the most weakness really aren't all that surprising. You know, things like commuting. Um, we still have many affluents who are working you know, partially at home, not going into the office full time. So in community, commuting expenses are likely going to you know, to drop for many of them. Uh, entertainment, you know, we still have, uh, we don't have big audiences, we don't have big blockbuster movies, 
Uh, we don't have concert venues that have gotten back to you know pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the other side of it is, it, you know, as you think about it, um, we're not sure, given the um, the change in how people are, you know, entertaining themselves. So, you know, looking at things like streaming video on demand, which increased so significantly during the pandemic, um, the, there really is going to be a very difficult time for entertainment to get back to normalcy, to get back to numbers that we, you know, that we've seen pre-pandemic. Uh, I think we've seen choices shifting so significantly uh, that this could be a permanent issue for entertainment, uh, yeah, as well as dining out. Uh, and, and of course, um, you know, on top of it, if we're not going into the office as much, uh, or we're not going out uh, as much to to the movies or to dine, you know, to dinner or, or to um, uh, to entertainment venues, uh, apparel is is going to continue to lag. You know, it just doesn't cost as much to buy a pair of sweatpants as it does to buy, you know, a wonderful pair of slacks or a you know black cocktail dress. So, you know, the eternal question really does come down to this: uh, you know, are there good times ahead, or is there cause for concern? You know, is that glass half empty or half full? Uh, it's our belief um, that, you know, we that there's hope. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the you know the three things I want you to take away from today's session are, are the following. You know, that first, uh, above all, that marketers can continue to expect affluence are going to lead economic recovery. Uh, they will likely uh, continue to spend at rates significantly higher than non-affluent population. Uh, in our experience, you know, over looking at this market for the past 47 years. Even in troubled times through pandemics, recessions, Wall Street corrections, um, affluents are always the first to return to spending at higher levels. You know, given the data that we are seeing currently uh, for 2023, as far as expectations are concerned, we believe that that is not going to be any different. That that the first population to get back to where they were in terms of uh, spending and, and potentially actually increase uh, is the affluent population. Secondly, you know, given how hard the last few years have been, it really, it's just messed with people's psyches. We've moved from one disaster to the next, you know, whether it is um, health related, financial related, uh, weather related, we just, you know, continue to uh, be you know beaten down with uh, difficulties. Uh, we're really uh, happy or thrilled uh, to report that we do see that there's a you know glimmer of hope that optimism uh, that uh, optimism is on the rise again, uh, and that we are uh, hoping against hope uh, that we're going to get back to that that wonderful period of time uh, where we saw optimism far outweigh pessimism uh, for you know many years for a continued period of time. Uh, good times, you know, in my view, are on the horizon. I think affluents are seeing you know, clouds breaking up, uh, at least for themselves and their families. Um, and that is likely going to result in that increased spending. Um, you know, lastly, uh, we do want to uh, continue to stress that that all of this really has to be viewed uh, with an eye towards the external factors that are out there. Um, those things that could either, you know, moderate uh, the recovery or you know, potentially cause it to retract. Uh, you know, we will continue to monitor those things in our barometers and our regular studies, uh, but we want to make sure that we understand the impact of inflation you know, changes in the Federal Reserve, interest rates, uh, and other factors that are, that are going to come along that could have an impact. Uh, and it could be positive or negative. Uh, you know, even things like, you know, concern about interest rates uh, have a, you know, potential uh, impact on markets on, the, on Wall Street. Uh, but for some affluents, particularly older affluents, they could actually increase, you know, these increased rates uh, could provide a windfall in terms of 
savings and, and other accounts, other financial accounts that they have. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor this and, and look to see how this is going to play out over the course of the year and continue to report back to everybody. Uh, but to me, you know, the bottom line is that the, the glass is looking more than helpful at this time for affluence. Uh, I don't uh, believe that it is looking that way for the non-affluent population just yet. But again, affluents tend to lead uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, as the year moves on, the rest of the population will benefit from it. So yeah, as I said, uh, your today's session was really focused on, on the emotional side of things, uh, the hopes, the aspirations, the expectations. Um, we're going to uh, invite you all to our next webinar on February 28th, about a month from now. Uh, and then we're gonna discuss the specifics of affluent financial planning uh, and investing for the year ahead. That session's not just for you know, financial planning accounts because it really does um, have um, a bearing on all markets on how affluents are going to spend or save um, over the course of uh, the near term uh, and, and frankly long term. We're going to spend some time in that session looking at retirement uh, and what's important to people both emotionally and financially. Uh, so we I, we think it's going to be an interesting topic for uh, for many people. The registration page uh, is currently available on the Ipsos website. Uh, and as we follow up with all of you uh, in the next few days, uh, we'll send you uh, a link to that page so you can register directly. Uh, for now, we, uh, we want to uh, thank you guys for your time. Uh, wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, I don't think, Jesse, um, I don't think we have any questions from the audience. I know we're running out of time, but uh, let me know if that's not the case. No questions. Excellent. We'll talk to them next one. All right. Uh, again, thank you all for uh, for your time today. We really appreciate uh, the attention that, uh, that you give us. So have a great uh, rest of your day, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you.